Welcome to Technology and Education Today. I'm Richard Smith. And I'm Caroline Crawford, and we are coming to you from the University of Houston Clear Lake in Houston, Texas, USA. And today we're discussing disruptive technologies in the field of higher education. Caroline, what's an example of a disruptive technology? Any type of technology that's changing the game plan. Some type of innovation that is coming in and helping people rethink what we are actually doing in the classroom or in actually any environment. What would you define as disruptive? The overhead projector? <laughs> Chalk, chalkboards, um, anything and everything. Film was, television was considered, actually, all radio. Those, yeah, all those things were pretty disruptive when they were first uh, introduced. Wasn't that fun? They'd always talk about, oh, well, we have this great new technology. It'll get rid of teachers. Brilliant. All of our students will learn the same thing over and over again doesn't make a difference. Instructional design and the quality of the instructor makes the difference. <laughs> That's right. Actually, remember back when, well, you wouldn't remember, but I remember. Thank you for that. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> when Edison introduced, the, in, introduced film into the classroom and said that this would bring the world into the classroom and we, we could get rid of textbooks. Didn't work. But these days, I think the big deal in uh, disruptive technologies, or what's now being de des um, designated as a disruptive technology, are the uh, MOOCs. Massive open online courses? Yeah, th those are them. And uh, you know, they are, uh, well, if, if you haven't heard of them, but I think most people have, uh, they are designed to provide educational opportunities for students who would not normally have access to a university, high quality or any quality for that matter, and they can enroll up to 100,000, 200,000 or more students in, in each course. When you say enroll, what do you mean by enroll? Do you mean able to lurk within a MOOC environment or actually engage within a MOOC environment? No, they engage. They are they are they sign up for the uh, MOOC and then they receive the instruction through the MOOC and this is usually these days and we're in the early stages of the MOOCs now is accomplished by watching videos of an instructor delivering a lesson that would normally be delivered to a uh, classroom of a smaller group consisting of a smaller group of uh, students. So if a course had... Uh, in a lecture style though, there's no interaction going on or is there one or two other people in the videotape or is it a talking head of the the instructor, the person whom anyone would want to sit in their class to glean the quality of knowledge from this person. The ones, I've, the ones I've seen so far are basically... You shouldn't go like that when I'm talking about thought <laughs> process. <laughs> ...are basically uh, uh, lectures. They are a lecture uh, that would normally be delivered to a, a class of students a anywhere. A it could be hall? 20 students, 100 students, went on campus and they have recorded that lecture. Either they have recorded it as it was in progress or the uh, professor has been taken into a studio and uh, done a special one 20 minute, 30, 40 minute uh, video of, on a particular topic. And that, in essence, is the guts of the uh, MOOC. How is the streaming quality? Well, it depends One on, might ask for a 30, 40 minute lecture. De it depends where you are, what equipment you have. So that's, that's a, uh, a variable. Uh, but the other qu question is, you know, what, other, what else is involved in there? Well, there could be reading assignments. Uh, there could be some form of uh, a written assignment, but then the question is, who evaluates the written assignment? That's where you, get, that's where you have a uh, And does someone actually want credit for this MOOC course? Do they want some type of certification, or are they just there for the knowledge, and that's what they want to take away from the experience? Good point. And this is where that disruptive business that you're talking about comes in, because you have all these students in the United States and in particular overseas that are taking uh, these courses uh, as MOOCs who now have completed the course, and what do they have to show for it? Well. It, now the people who run the MOOCs have determined that they need to provide some sort of uh, cert certification or a, a certificate to these students indicating that they have studied and learned what was taught in the uh, MOOC. And you can see where that's going. Well, on the other hand, we, you were there speaking with the professor from New Zealand last February, I believe it was, or March, mm -hmm. and she was also running MOOCs. For, for not only her course, but anyone who wanted to come and join in. 
And if the person wanted credit for that course experience after the fact, they could apply and submit all of their assignment deliverables for evaluation. And if they were willing to pay the tuition, then they could obtain credit for it. If they Univers earned... University credit. Yes. Well, that's, that's one model. Um, and so there are certificates. There's a potential for after the experience grade allocation. Right. But, all, but the problem is when you have 100,000 students who are enrolled in a class, how do you evaluate the work of 100,000 students to determine that that student has actually earned a certificate? Well, one way of doing it is through a, um, a test, an online test. It would have to be a test that could be graded automatically by, via a uh, computer, which would mean a multiple choice true-false uh, test. Uh, most likely, or um, one could, I imagine you could be divided up into smaller groups, discuss, discussion groups, and each student within a discussion group could certify that another student had indeed participated, and that student had looked at that student's work and determined that, determined that it, it was of sufficient quality. I mean, but It's I, interesting, it's like we're going through this process all over again. When we first started with online learning, we were talking about the instructional design of a course, and nobody really talked about the um, interactive activities that were necessary and appropriate to reflect the learning and um, higher order thinking skills and conceptual frameworking that needs to occur within a social environment by Gatsky and <laughs> Wittgenstein, all that good stuff, social discourse. I, I knew she would get that. <laughs> Duh! And um, that wasn't really on the plate for several years when we were talking about online learning. It was all about instructional design and if you designed it well without considering the human component. It it almost sounds like that's occurring again with the MOOCs. That it's all about the quality of the instructor and people are going to come because of the reputation of the instructor and whatever the person is spouting. And there hasn't really, it hasn't come to the point of serious consideration towards instructional design, much less interactive activities that are appropriate and necessary within an online environment. That has already been suggested over and over and over again for what is it 15 years now right and over you know what but, but the people who who are running so we're redoing we're yes. reinventing the wheel over and over and over again it's brilliant and the people who are doing this this reinvention of the of the wheel for the MOOC discovering all these things are repeating the same mistakes that people have done when they implemented television in the classroom when they implemented film. instruction radio film one group does not bother to read the research that the other group has. Who knew, read. right? <laughs> Just because it's already been done. <laughs> and so they, go, they implement their new technology, and lo and behold, they rediscover all the things that the people have Look discovered. Look at that. It's innovative. <laughs> it's getting published. Previously. <laughs> Even though it's the same exact results over and over and over again. But, but you know, the, in, but the MOOCs here are, are kind of a threat to the Traditional. Uh, traditional university because yes. with this certification process and weak or as strong as it may be, uh, they are offering the students something that they could bring to a, an employer and say, look, I passed this course, I, I have this knowledge, I may, not have a, I may not have gone to a university, but uh, I have a certificate from uh, something that's kind of like a university. And they could potentially... Wow, this is a slippery slope. They could potentially... <laughs> well, it's kind of, sort of, not really, but you know, it's... Well, what? What? <laughs> well, but, you know, when these MOOCs... So, did you actually earn anything or not? <laughs> it's hard. Well, you certainly couldn't tell the quality of what they, what they learned. Uh, the, the, let's say... Well, that's true within a traditional environment as well. Right, but within a traditional environment, you know that there are, there are levels of universities, and within the universities, at least up until the last decade or so, there were a level, you could judge the level of a student within a university. Now there's a tendency of grade inflation so that uh, a lot of times most everybody gets, gets an A. But, well, it depends on the quality of the professor, too, of the instructor. And then, well, then you would also know that the instructor... Let's be honest. Yes, but you <laughs> Between are, that and, gee, everybody gets an A. No, not everybody gets an right. A. Like many of my students earn, earn a grade of A in the courses. But on the is a viable reason for that. Most everybody else drops out early in my courses within the first few weeks. Oh, this is a lot of work. I didn't realize. Yeah, you're, I you're, warned you. You're, you're, she's a real sweetie. But, but in, in, es, in essence... Yeah. In, <laughs> I try to help, but you know. In essence, the, 
the, the way of judging a degree, which uh, traditionally has been by the reputation of the university and the reputation of the instructor in the university, uh, if you accept the idea of the MOOCs uh, as an equivalent, has now been uh, chipped, chipped away. Uh, and one can only wonder what, what the result of that is, uh, is going to be. I'm still thinking about the quality of the professor that we're talking well, interesting, about. Well, interestingly, is it the research quality or is it the instructional quality? Well, it's a combination. Is it, but, is it the product, the student product that but interestingly is enough, the reputation? In, interestingly you can keep cutting in, it's fine. <laughs> interestingly enough, well, we only have about one more minute okay. to go. <laughs> interestingly <laughs> enough, um, the, it turns out if you're going to be delivering your, your, your primary information in a MOOC via television, that a professor who, in a classroom who can get away with certain lecturing deficiencies cannot get away with that on, uh, on, a, on video. It, you, that person just doesn't look good, doesn't sound good. And what's happening now is that there is, there is at least one or two uh, of these companies that run these MOOCs that are now considering or have, or have done, uh, uh, have hired a professional actor or somebody who's skilled at delivering lines to deliver the instruction. Now, this may this may not be as far fetched as you as you might think. I'm a little shocked by that. But that's that's because if interesting. It is, but it gets the idea over to the students in as clear and fashion as possible. For instance, if you go to certain websites of large companies like like an investment house like Fidelity, you'll find all sorts of lessons that are offered on in in on their. Uh, on nice their website. Well done. <laughs> we don't get any extra money. <laughs> I had to harass you about that. Sorry. <laughs> but, but the instruction, or Hyundai for that matter, or, or keep Kia going. Mo Kia, <laughs> Kia marketing, Motors. marketing, marketing. <laughs> uh, but but the fact is, when they provide instruction for the the people who are going to use their cars, who are going to make possible investments, they don't have a broker that's delivering these lessons. They have a professional actor that's giving, that's delivering the lessons, and that's why they they look so slick and they they sound so good. They're, they are in studios, unlike uh, what we oh, have things here. Things you learn. Didn't the know that. that. Makes sense. Didn't Makes, know that. At any rate, we have reached the end of this issue of Technology and Education Today. I'm Richard Smith. I'm Caroline Crawford. And we are again coming to you from University of Houston Clear Lake in Houston, Texas, USA. Bye!